Good morning, church. It's great to be with you guys. My name is Jason. I'm excited to worship with you all this morning. Happy Father's Day to the fathers out there. Thank you guys for all that you do to lead your families and your children well. Um, Let's stand to our feet as we do. I am going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into worship this morning. God, thank you for this day. Just thank you for the opportunity to be here to sing praises to you. God, we thank you um, that we can come before you together as a church with one voice and declare that you are good and that you are worthy of all of our praise wherever we're at in our life. We thank you, God, for your son, Jesus. We thank you that we can worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing, church.
as a church that when we seek you you will be found God even in the darkest times even the hardest times in the hills in the valleys in the mountaintops experiences alike you are God and you are good and we can trust you God we thank you that you are God who can be found and that you find us and that you draw us to you you are so great and so holy and so worthy of all the praise we can possibly muster. We love you, God. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning, New Hope. We are so happy that you've chosen to join us today. Our mission here is to help people find hope one step at a time. If this is your first time visiting us, we'd love to connect with you after the service. Take a moment to stop by our guest services desk in the lobby for a small gift and more information about New Hope and our ministries. The annual 127 yard sale is just a little over a month away. Booths will once again be available in our New Hope parking lot August 1st through 3rd with all space rentals proceeds going directly to supporting our ongoing missions in Uganda, Africa. It's a great way to declutter your house and make a little extra money, all while supporting a mission of sharing the hope of Jesus across the globe. Vendor agreements and registrations are now open on our app and at newhopecc.org slash events. Life is full of challenges, and we want you to know that no matter what you are going through, you don't have to do it alone. Our New Hope Care Ministry has an incredible team of trained, compassionate people who will listen, encourage, support, and pray with you. The prayer of all the care providers is to help bring you hope, healing, and truth in the midst of life's uncertainties. Whether you have a prayer request or wanting to meet with a caregiver one-on-one, -on -one, or simply looking for more information about this ministry, we want to hear from you. Send an email to care at newhopecc.org and let us walk alongside you through whatever it is that you're facing. As always, we are so appreciative of your ongoing support for New Hope and our ministries. Your tithes and your offerings make it possible for us to continue sharing the gospel here, there, and everywhere. If you'd like to give, you can set up a one-time or recurring gift online or place your offerings in the boxes near the door. Now join us as we continue to turn our hearts and minds towards Jesus. Well, happy Father's Day. I hope you're having a great day. Dads, we love a little competition. In fact, we'll, we're willing sometimes to blow out a knee or a hamstring over a backyard game of wiffle ball, right? So <clears throat> we're hoping nobody gets injured today, but we're going to do a little competition, all right? I need two, like, middle school age students to volunteer for me, all right? I have some work for you to do. You're fast. Come on up here. You're fast. Come on, you got, you got voluntold by mom. You're going, I need one more, one more. Who? Bradley or Brayden, who is it? All right, Brayden, come on, man. Both of you got voluntold. You know, first service, I had two kids like, I'll do it. Not today. All right, I'm going to give you that. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to play a little music. Dads, when you came in, you got a little piece of paper. Hopefully, you already have your name on that, first and last name. Make sure it's legible, because if I pull it and I can't read it, it's just going by the wayside, all right? Um, so, first and last name, they're going to, you don't have to sprint, all right? I don't want you pulling a hamstring. You're going to go around the edges, come through the middle, some music's going to play. Dads, your goal is to get your paper into the basket. I will draw a basket for a delicious meat gift. I don't know. It's a meat basket, right? So, I mean, who does not love delicious meats? Salty, nitrogen-filled meats, all right? So, go ahead and start the music. You guys go around, collect some name tags. You got to move. You got to move. You're going around. Put it on your head. Come on now. Put it on your head. 
dads, feel free to move. Feel free to move. Slam dunk, just don't injure a kid. All right, we're not trying to injure nobody. Uh-oh, you just got posterized. Keep going, keep going. Oh, we're getting chased. Bobbing and weaving. Bobbing and weaving over here. Oh, the sneak attack. The sneak attack, oh, we're running with coffee. Oh no, it fell out, I saw that. It's, it's tough, it's tough. All right, I got five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, time. All right, basketeers, thank you for your service. I will take these. All right, we're gonna dump these. Braden, can I get, you don't have any in your basket? Brother, brother. All right, well, sorry if you got it in Braden's. He's too fast, too fast. All right, here we go. Now, the first one I pull out is not the winner. I just want you to feel the sting of loss. As I call your name and go, and you are not the winner, Randy Miller. Sorry. That's so painful, isn't it? Oh, it hurts my heart for him. Sorry. This one's the winner. Todd Whelan, come on up. <laughs> Last second edition. All right, sorry, Randy. Oh, man, now I feel so bad. Here you go. That was really mean. I'm sorry. But you lucked out. Congratulations. Oh, happy Father's Day. <clears throat> Our dads taught us things, some good, some bad, right? Like you could probably repeat some things your dad said. You're like, probably shouldn't repeat that. Some intentional, like when you're a son and you finally have that conversation where your dad looks at you and says, you will not speak to my wife that way. You're like, oh, this is different now. We are playing a different game at this point. Or sometimes it's unintentional. You just pick up things via osmosis from dad. Again, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Some of you picked up rooting for the wrong football team <laughs> via osmosis. And that's unfortunate for you, and that's okay. Some of us picked up the good stuff. Um, you know, but like you, you just, you experienced things, you saw things, you heard things, you saw the way maybe a dad interacted with friends, uh, you saw the way dad maybe treated mom, you, you, you just, you learn things from dad. And here's the thing, that's going to happen. If you're a dad in the room, that's going to happen for you too. Your kids are going to learn things from you. So how about this? Let's introduce the idea of being intentional about what our kids learn from us. Like, let's really think through what are we teaching them. So I'll ask you this question. What are you passionate about? What are the things that, like, get your heart rate going a little bit? What are the things that excite you? What are, what are the things that maybe bring some tears to your eyes? What are the things that keep you awake at night? What are the things that cause you to, like, I'm going to get up early to do this? Right? And, and what are we passionate about? And listen, please hear me. I, I've, you, you may feel like I'm coming at you a little bit hard today, dads. And so I'll say a couple of qualifiers. One, this is, if you are a believer, if you consider yourself a follower of Christ, this is for you too. Because there's a reality that there are generations of people behind us who will look to us as spiritual leaders. And yes, we're talking specifically in the context of being a father this morning. I also understand that maybe you're going, I didn't have a great father experience. And I want you to hold on to that because we're actually going to talk about that in a second. And I'm also not coming at you going like, hey, you're not allowed to have fun anymore in life. You're not allowed to watch football with your kids. You're not allowed to take your kids hunting or fishing or camping. Like, I, I am not saying any of that. In fact, those are some of my best memories and where a lot of intentional conversations happened for me growing up. All I'm doing is asking what are we deeply passionate about and what are we teaching intentionally or accidentally to generations behind us? 
There's a psalm, Psalm chapter 78. It's actually the longest historical psalm. I don't know why that's going to bug me. I'm going to trip over it and fall and it'll be funny. Psalm 78 is the longest historical psalm. And it's basically an overview of the history of the children of Israel, right? It's this history of what happened to them. It's a story. And it's a psalm by a guy by the name of Asaph, and he is a prolific psalmist. In fact, he uh, was in the courts when David was king. He was uh, a Levite, and so not only was he a psalmist, but he was a teacher of the word of God, of the law. Like he, this is what he did. And so he writes this psalm, and it's a really, really, really important psalm. And it's still really, really important for us today, especially the first eight verses. It says this, Oh, my people, listen to my instruction. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories, all right, underline that word, stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they will in turn teach it to their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. There's two through lines, so to speak, in this psalm, in Psalm 78. The first through line that kind of goes from the beginning to the end is this idea and a reminder that the people of God, the Israelites, were a stubborn, rebellious, disobedient, unfaithful people. Asaph wants us to remember that. He wanted his audience to remember that. However, there's another through line that kind of runs parallel with that through line, and that's this, that even though that happened, there was also this repeated unfailing mercy of God to a disobedient people. That's an important story to tell. That rebellious, disobedient, unfaithful people can still experience the mercy of God in an unfailing way. And he uses the word stories. We want these stories passed down. See, I think sometimes we think about instructing the next generation or uh, teaching the next generation about their faith in an educational format. Like we're going to sit down and we're going to do a Bible study together and I'm going to walk you through a curriculum and we're going to do it that way. But that, that was never the intention. The intention was for us to be storytellers. This is what Jesus did. This is what, to this day, effective communicators understand, that people listen to stories. They hear stories. They remember stories. More than likely, you have a favorite movie that you watched 30 years ago, and you still remember the story. You remember how you felt when you watched that movie, when you were sitting in a theater or wherever you were, you remember that story. You you love a good book. Right? Like a summer book to read. I know some of you teachers, you have like these summer book lists, and my wife's got a book. She's like, I can't wait to get home and read. I'm like, oh, cool. Because you like a good story. You like a good character. You like a hero. You like a villain. We remember those things. Jesus, in most of his teaching, at some point along the way, just tells a story. In fact, he goes, let me tell you a story. Because he knows We'll remember stories because stories are real. Like they, people feel things in stories. People have real emotions with real lives and real things happen. We, we love a movie, right, when the guy gets the girl in the end. But we also love a movie where like it doesn't end the way we kind of hope and think it should. Like maybe it's a sadder ending, but we go, well, that's real life too. And so I feel something in that. I connect with that. And the instruction here is, hey, don't sit down and work through a curriculum. The instruction is to pass these stories of how God worked and how God moved to your children and 
so that one day kids who aren't even born yet will hear these stories because we remember stories. It was an oral thing passed down from generation to generation of how God moved and how God worked. And again, to circle back and go back to, man, the generation before me didn't do a great job of this. I actually experienced a lot of hurt and pain from the generation behind me. So what am I supposed to do? Well, there's actually good news in verse 7. He tells us, so each generation should set its hope anew, meaning something new can happen with you. And this is so meaningful to me because I'm a byproduct of this. I'm a byproduct of the generation behind me saying, we're going to set our hope anew on something different than how my family has lived and experienced life up to this point. And because of that, because of people like my dad, who said, I'm setting my hope anew, my life is forever different because of that. Forever different. And it's not that I don't, we just pretend like these terrible things didn't happen in our family's lives, but it's that, no, there's actually something fresh and new can happen, and we can hear stories about how God works. If we are a follower of Jesus, again, even if you don't have kids, right, maybe you, maybe you coach, maybe you're in middle school and there's some elementary students that think you are the coolest person in the world. I promise you they do. You're in high school and you've got some kids behind you. You're a young adult. You've got people looking at you. If we consider ourselves a follower of Jesus, this is not optional, In fact, you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. This was like so foundational to their way of life. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. The author's trying to communicate, this just needs to be a part of your everyday life. This isn't like, hey, we need to set aside this time in the morning when we all wake up, or we need to make sure we gather together around this. It's like, no, just when you're waking kids up, and when you're going to bed, and when you're on the road, and when you're going to whatever sporting event, and when you're there, and when you're at a restaurant, and when we're in the car, or wherever it is, find ways to basically be a storyteller pass along to the generation behind us of how God has moved and how God has worked. And then you go to the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy, my dear son, right? Paul has this, uh, it's not his real son. He's just somebody that he has mentored and brought up and sees as a spiritual son. He says, Timothy, my dear son, Be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. These things aren't a list of do's and don'ts. The things that Paul had taught Timothy was what he saw happen with Jesus and with like how he's seen God move. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Do we... Do we pick up on what's happening here? Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. The design was that this just gets passed on through stories from generation to generation. And if we approach it that way, it doesn't end. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree, an associate's degree. You don't have to have a biblical, uh, you know, doctorate or anything like that. Let me pass on to you what I have learned. We talked about this last week in... um, And here and in our young adults group that met last Sunday night, this idea that when the church exploded and it went from 120 people to 3,000 in a day, uh, they now like, well, we can't all gather together, so they're meeting in homes. And here's what it says. It says, they taught what they heard the apostles teach. Right? They, didn't, they didn't craft a sermon. They, they, they weren't like trying to sound eloquent in their speech. They're like, well... Here's what Paul told me, and I'm just going to pass it along to you guys. It was just telling the stories. Being a father 
is being a leader. It's leading in this area, specifically to your family. But we all have people we can lead spiritually. Now, this is a morbid question, okay? But I think it's worth asking. I I think it's worth reflection on this. But if you were to die today, what, what would people say? What are the stories that would be told? Now, it's actually a really great honor to go to a end of life service for somebody, a memorial service. It's actually an honor to be there and experience that. And he, here's, I, I love it when family gets up and tells funny stories. Because to me, that's like this person like enjoyed life and had some joy and like they just, they love their family to be transparently stupid around them. I love that. But also, would, would people go, like, for me, like, was this Mike's life? That, like, he was passionate about who God was and seeing God move and work. I, I, I have to ask myself that. So we're going to look briefly in the book of Joshua. Before Joshua, Moses, uh, we see his final speech to the people in Deuteronomy and it's kind of lengthy and he's just he knows like this is it for me and he's telling the people these final thoughts and then he dies and Joshua becomes the new leader now it's interesting just a little side note Moses is uh, described as Moses my servant is dead is what is told to Joshua this word servant, uh, is, it's slave. You see, so often we have this idea of what leadership is like. That like, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, and I become a leader from what I can get from people, but that's not real good leadership. Real good leadership is going, what can I give to people? There's an emptying of oneself that happens when you become a leader. You know, people always, if, if you, like, own a business, you, you know what this is like. People are like, must be nice, right? Own your own business, being able to do what you want, when you want. And, yeah, maybe that's an upside. But, like, you know, your employees aren't getting the late-night calls. They don't feel the weight of taking care of people's families with paychecks and making sure people get paid and people have work. And, like, they, 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 don't, they don't have the weight of, like, okay, how do we move this business from here to here and, and the way the landscape is and the way culture is? How do we navigate that? They don't have that. But a, a leader who thinks servant-minded thinks through those things. And it's not always for their benefit. In fact, they they usually get the raw end of the deal. Because it's not just about how much money you make as a leader. In fact, being a good servant leader might put you in the grave a little earlier. Moses, it says he was 120. We go, that's really old. I don't think it's an accident that Scripture also tells us, Moses, my servant, is dead. And then it goes on to say his eyesight was clear and he was as strong as ever. Like, it wasn't like he was a frail person on his deathbed, and we have this moment, like, he was good. He was good. Like, there's an emptying of self. And that can happen if we operate through the power of the Holy Spirit, like we talked about last week. Apart from that, it's burnout. It's disaster. It's chaos. So Joshua chapter 1 through 3, let me just kind of tell you what's going on. This leadership mantle is passed from Moses to Joshua. And the instruction is given, hey, I want you to cross this Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River, at least the time I went there, was not this fast-flowing river. In fact, they have these like balconies there with these little stairs down in certain spots so people can go down and get baptized in the Jordan River. But if you go during what Scripture says the harvest season, it is not a mild, nice little river. In fact, it, it overflows because snow can melt off the mountains and come down. It's the rainy season. And so the, the river overflows and goes up the banks. It becomes a lot bigger. And if you look up pictures, Jordan River during the harvest season, it is a rapid, dangerous river, right? So the instruction is I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant and I want you to cross the river. 
But don't worry, here's some instructions about how to do this, and I'll take care of you, God tells them. And that's what happens, right? The leaders take the ark, and as soon as their feet hit the water, the water basically dams up upstream, and for miles down until the sea, it just rushes out and empties, and they're able to just cross on not just an empty river, but it actually says dry ground. Does this miracle sound familiar to anything else they have experienced as a people, right? The parting of the Red Seas. And so they have this moment, and all the people, and there's a lot of people. This isn't like this room of people crossing a river. There's just a lot of people crossing a river. They all get across, and they experience this incredible miracle, this thing that took place. And now in Joshua chapter 4, God's not done yet, though. He gives them some more instructions, and he says, When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take twelve stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Right? So they go into the, into the water. They're holding the ark. As long as they're in there, the water's cool, and people are, are crossing while they're standing there. And he goes, Now I want you to pick twelve men, and I want you to go to that place. I want you to go to the middle of the river, pick up stones from there, and take them out of the river. Verse 4, so Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel, and he said to them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulders. So this isn't like, let me get a little river rock. This is a stone. This is a, I have to put it on my shoulder. It's going to be a substantial size stone. Put it up on your shoulder. All right, and carry it across, 12 stones in all for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is the instruction given. And then he says, this is what we're going to do. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the instruction is cross the river, do it this way, but then there's this important detail afterwards. It's like, I want you to get these 12 stones and I want you to build a little rock pile memorial so that when your kids see them, they'll go, why are these here? And then you can go, oh, well, this is where we crossed the Jordan River where God did this miraculous thing. It was that simple, but it was really important. It was simple, but important and powerful. And Joshua is obedient to this simple task. You see, the miracle God was going to do wasn't just for them, but it was for future generations as well. The way God has miraculously moved in your life is not just for your benefit, but it's for future generations as well. It's so that people will go, well, what is that? What happened there? Well, here's what happened, let me tell you. And then you fast forward in chapter 4 to verse 14. It says, That day the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. And for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they had revered Moses. Which is like, you don't get much more revered than Moses for the Israelites. But from that day forward, it was like Moses and Joshua. Why? Because he stacked some stones? Like that was it? That was the thing that made him a great leader? No, the thing that made him a great leader was his obedience to do something simple, but yet would communicate and teach future generations. It wasn't just about the stones. It was about what it represented. It was about storytelling, passing along the story of what God did for these people. And again, there's a reality. If we're a follower of Jesus, we need to be spiritual leaders pointing others to the incredible work of Christ. And so, like, we build memorials in our life. We we have a service at the end of our life, and maybe there's a tombstone, and maybe there's an urn, or, or there's a service, or whatever it is. There's some kind of memorial. And so we'll specifically, again, talk to dads, but what kind of difference are we making in 
Have we assembled stones of remembrance for who God is in our life, or have we assembled stones of remembrance for something else? And we value something else maybe more than we value who God is and the work that he does. And I'm not against any of these things, but have we built stones of remembrance for our favorite hobby, for entertainment, for athletics? Have we made something else the thing? And you see, it's not even about that thing. It's about our heart towards that thing. It's about what we attribute as value to that. Because again, man, I can have some meaningful conversations in a tree stand with my kid about nature and who God is and who made all of this. And like I, I can take these things that I love to do and use them as means to tell stories. So five quick things that, that dads you can do, like starting today. Spiritual leaders, things you can do starting today that will help us to develop this, that will help us do this. The first thing is this, pray for and with your kids. Pray for and with them. Even when they're really little and it seems like it, it's kind of silly, you know, like we, it's kind of funny the things that kids care about, that they're like, can we pray for this? Yes, pray for that. Pray for that thing at school or that friend or, you know, sometimes a prayer request is like, hey, I want tomorrow to be a really fun day. We're supposed to go do this. And like, that's okay. Pray for those things. Maybe it's at night when you're putting your kid to bed, just, hey, is there anything we can pray for when they're real little? And don't exclude praying for your kids. Don't just think like, well, you know, I, I pray for my kids. Like, there is power in that and believe and trust that there is power in praying for the generation behind us. Second thing is this, talk about God. Tell stories of God. And, and not just like in an educational, like let me walk you through a curriculum. Uh, let's let, learn these things and these things. But just find ways in your coming and your going to tell stories about who God is. Let me give you a perfect example of this. This last Friday, we had like a, a family thing up in Michigan, and so we all went up, and on the drive back, we're on the van, and we had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to, and honestly, I'd kind of like forgotten to share this with my family up to this point. It kind of hit me there. Last week, um, if you were here, at the end of our service, we, we prayed for a family, and we prayed for Chloe Marilla and just her fight with cancer and all those things. And honestly, I did a really bad job. I was just like, I was kind of overwhelmed with emotion last week. I didn't do a great job of explaining maybe some specifics of what we were praying for. Um, but she had a procedure done this week, this past week, Tuesday, where they had told her, hey, there's some things in your lungs we're pretty sure uh, now you are experiencing a fourth type of cancer, and it is metastasized to your lungs, which is really bad news, which is why we wanted to pray together. So then Wednesday, I get a text from the Marilat saying, God is so good, what they thought were tumors were just old infection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So... Our kids got to watch that, be a part of that, and then we get to share a story about how God worked and attribute glory to him. It was that easy. It was, a, it was literally a 30-second conversation. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we putting ourselves in situations to have to see God work? To where we have to trust him. Or are we doing everything in our own power constantly? To where we don't have an ability to go, here's how God worked. Here's how God moved. Here's what God did. Here's how God saved us. Here's the power of God. Because really it becomes about the power of dad. And my ability to provide or not provide. Or my ability to do this. And it's just not about us. The third thing is this, spend time alone with God. And you're going, well, your kids won't see that. They will. 
They won't see it happening, but they'll see you and they'll see your life change. And look, I got a house with four kids. You don't get a lot of alone time. So for me, it's when I get, when I get here to the office. Right? I come in a little bit earlier and I have some alone time. That's what it is. You find ways to be alone with God. Look, you love to sit in a tree stand, sit alone in a tree stand with God. You got a car ride, be alone with God in that car ride. Find ways to read his word, to spend time in prayer, praising him, because being alone with God will change how you are with other people. Fourth, allowing religious flexibility. Okay, this is kind of a tricky one. Oftentimes what we can do is we can... um, We can make this experience with God about things that it was never meant to be about. Right? So like my my prayer for my kids is they would just encounter the living God. And there's going to be some things sometimes that come up that I'm not comfortable with. There's going to be some moments, right? Like kind of growing up in a church tradition I did, it was like, hey, love God, great. Great. But actually what's more important is if you do this, 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 and don't do this, 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 this. And if at any time our kids maybe step outside of that, there's like something in us that's like, ugh. And so when I say like some religious flexibility, look, we want nothing more than for our kids to have their own moments where they can build stones of remembrance. But it might not always look the same way. God might be doing something new and different in them. Not that goes against his word. Please hear that. God will never lead us into something where his word says, don't do this or do this. But like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to try to control every little aspect of this because I'm not going to try to control the Holy Spirit. And then last, and this is an important one, don't give up on prodigals because often they will return. And believe that. I don't think it's an accident that that's a story that Jesus used to tell about a son who had wandered away from his father and walked away from everything he had been taught and shown and demonstrated and experienced and he made a poor choice and walked away from that. I don't think it's an accident that Jesus includes in the story a prodigal son coming back home. And yes, that story is to demonstrate the love of a father, but I think it also subconsciously demonstrates that yes, prodigals do come back sometimes because they have a moment of humility and they don't know where else to turn except the father. So don't stop hoping and believing and praying that that can happen. I I, I legitimately think these five things If we can do these, it changes things. It changes things. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. We're going to pray to dismiss. Or we're going to sing again. But here's what I want you to do. If you're around a dad, your dad, another dad, someone you see as a dad, um, I was going to ask you just to put, just Put your hand on, on your dad, right? I know dads are like, oh, man, don't touch me. If you really want to make him uncomfortable, just give him a big hug, you know, like just an embrace. And I just want to pray over our dads. And I know some couldn't be here this morning, and, you know, I, I, I get all that. But, like, I just want to do that this morning, all right? God, we uh, just pray over these dads. God, I'm thankful that they're here this morning. I pray that you would help them to have hope anew. 
And maybe they didn't get something from a generation before them, but help them to understand, to know, and to believe that it does not have to be that way from this point moving forward. That they can look at their kids, they can look at their families, they can look at the kids they coach and they mentor, they can look at the generation behind them and go, look, it doesn't matter what I experienced in the past because here's who I want to point you to and here's what I want you to hear about God and let me tell you the stories about what God did in my life. Help us to know and to believe that it is our responsibility to lead spiritually. To not give that up to somebody else, to not relinquish that responsibility, but to own it. And to be confident in that role, not because of our abilities or inabilities, only our confidence is because of you. Help us to put ourselves in situations where, where we're obedient to you that leads us sometimes into unknown territories, into new things that we're uncomfortable with and we don't know, so that we can experience your goodness and the miracles and we can experience you in a powerful way so that we can point people to you. Let me set up some stones here so when people go, well, what happened? We can go, let me, let me tell you what happened. We are thankful that you are the same God today that you were for Joshua, that you were for Moses, and you still move in the same way. So God, I pray even in this moment with these dads, with family and friends around them, that you would well up hope within them. Not to dwell on what has been, what has happened, but well up hope about what will be and what you will do in their lives and the lives of their family. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen.
be undeniable to this world that who we are as followers of you that we love you that we'd be a city set on a hill brightly shining for those to see God I thank you for allowing us to be here in your presence this morning together as a church to be able to sing to you to be able to hear your words proclaimed God we love you we thank you we lift you up this morning in Jesus name amen thank you guys so much for being here again happy Father's Day have fun enjoy your day hope you get Uh, something good smoked and able to eat some good food. We love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.